Hello and welcome to Hobilam. We're so glad that you decided to join us today. We're going to have a great, powerful message. So I'm excited. Make sure you subscribe and make certain that you stay connected. Let's check out the sermon. Great moments are born out of great opportunity. Maybe some of you remember that or not, but of course this is uh, Herb Brooks' famous pregame speech at the 1980 Olympics in Lake Placid, New York. This team, this, this hockey team for the United States was not supposed to even be there. They weren't supposed to win anything. They were massive underdogs, and yet great moments come from great opportunities. They're playing the mighty Soviet Union who never loses, and they win one of the greatest upsets in Olympic history. And I don't know about you, but uh, do, you, do you remember that moment? Does anybody remember where you were in that moment? Okay. I love it how you're not afraid to say, yeah, I was there, right? Some of you are like, I'm not dating myself. That was in 1980, right? I'll, I'll take the lead. I'll date myself. That was two years before I was born. So, uh, but here's the thing. I feel this deep connection to those guys sitting in the locker room that day. Because I don't know about you, but I don't know how you could sit there with USA across your chest and not feel like you're a part of something bigger than yourself. I don't know if you've ever felt that way before, but sometimes the name on the front of the jersey is more important than the name on the back of the jersey. I'm on a team. I'm in a group. I'm in a community. I don't know. I'm a part of a church. I'm a part of a vision. I'm a part of a calling that is much bigger than myself. Great moments are born from great opportunity. In that moment, history was calling. And that team had to answer the call. They had to answer the call. When's the last time that you felt a part of something bigger than yourself? When's the last time that you uh, were a part of something and you knew that in order to accomplish this task, in order to accomplish this mission, it had to be bigger than you. It was beyond you. When we were young, I don't know about you, but you had your, your circle of friends. I had my little Sandlot gang, and we did everything together. And I felt a sense of community and belonging. And maybe for you it was a club or a, a choir or a sports team or something like that. Or maybe you go to college and you're a sorority or fraternity and you're in a dorm and you're connected with people. But then all of a sudden you grow up and it's a little bit harder to feel that sense of belonging and that sense of purpose. It doesn't go away, but we tend to isolate ourselves. We get involved and we get really busy in different hobbies and activities and clubs and groups and classes and things like that. And those are all well and good, but the problem is they're not enough. They can't satisfy your soul. And there's a reason for that, is that you and I were created to partner with God's kingdom. You and I were created to be a part of something bigger than ourselves, to partner in bringing heaven to earth. Amen? To partner with God's kingdom. For others of you, you're disconnected today. You're not a part of something like I'm describing here this morning. And for some of you, finding your purpose is on the other side of your isolation. You cannot fulfill God's purpose for your life disconnected. You cannot fulfill God's purpose for your life alone. You were made for more. The Apostle Paul says this at the very beginning of chapter 4, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. Let's read it nice and loud together up on the screen. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. Everybody say calling. calling. You have a calling. What is that calling? It's to be a part of something bigger than you. To live for something that matters. To live for something that will last. And it is our deepest prayer as we enter into these next four weeks together that you would find a sense of that calling, a sense of that purpose, a sense of that connection right here in this body of Christ. We often sing a song, we sing, He is up to something, God is up to something, He is up to something, God is up to something right now. We sing that something. You want to know what that something is? Just in case you're new, and for those of you that are new, welcome. We're so glad you're here, whether you're in the room or worshiping with us online. I'll tell you what that something is. Marriages are being healed. 
Marriages are being restored. God's putting lives back together. Addiction, the chains of addiction are being broken in the people's lives that are sitting around you here this morning. Sicknesses are being healed with no explanation. As we sang this morning, miracles, signs, and wonders. The lost are being found. People are finding their purpose. They're finding a sense of of value and community and belonging. Most importantly, lives are being transformed by Jesus Christ. Amen? It's happening all around you, okay? And you've got two choices as we enter into this campaign together. You can sit on the sideline, or if God is calling out, it is time to answer the call. Everybody say, answer the call. Because when God's on the other line, it's time to answer the call. Say, answer the call. We got to pick up and answer the call. What is that call? A couple weeks ago, Pastor Brian and I tag teamed up here, and we kind of cast a vision for where we're going as a church. And so I'm not going to rehash all of that, but to remind you is from Matthew chapter 5. Jesus is speaking and he's giving the Sermon on the Mount and he calls us to shine our light. Jesus says this to a ragtag bunch of misfits and villagers and outcasts out on the city limits, Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus says this. Let's read it together. You are the light of the world. A town on a hill cannot be hidden. In the same way, Let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. That is the vision. That is to call to let our lights shine to a group of common, ordinary villagers and to us here this morning. Jesus says, you are more a part of this than you know. Oh, you're in this now. You are a part of this. You have a calling now. To that group of people and to us, Jesus says what it means to be a part of a church is to shine your light, yes, individually, but also together. To shine your light so that the city of Des Moines would never be the same. So that lives would be changed for eternity. and So that we get the glory so that it's all about hope, Elam. No, so that God gets the glory. Amen? It's not about us. It's about him. Amen? Turn to your neighbor right and say, it's not about you. Tell your neighbor that right now. It's not about you. It's not about you. It's absolutely not. Here's what I found out about callings, and maybe you've realized this as well. If your calling is only about you, you need a bigger calling. Think about it this way. If your vision for your life, if a dream that you have, your big dream in life came true, how many people would it bless other than you? Does it bless anybody beyond you, or is it self-seeking? Is it all about you? Think about this. This is also true. If you can accomplish your purpose in life alone, you need a bigger purpose. If you can accomplish your calling, if you can accomplish your purpose on your own, God's probably not in it because you don't need him. And what I want to share with you today is that you and I have a calling, as Paul alluded to, that's something much bigger. That is our invitation to you as a church, as today, Sunday, October 29th, 2023, we are officially kicking off the Shining the Light Together Capital Campaign. Amen? That's where we're going. Now, I figured when I said that, that would be the response I get, okay? Because I don't think anybody in here woke up this morning and was like, I got to get myself to church. I can't wait to be asked for my money. Get get me there. Like, I am so excited. I've been waiting for a capital campaign. The church just doesn't talk about money enough. We need to to beat people over the head with money and fork over the cash a little bit more. I'm guessing that's not the case. But this is my invitation. This is our invitation. This is our challenge. That over these next four weeks— you would catch a glimpse, and even today, that you would catch a glimpse of the vision that God has for this church, and that it would compel you to be a part of it. That you would get so excited, not about a giving campaign, but you would get so excited about what God is doing in this place, because we talk about the things that we love. We talk about the things that we're passionate about, and that you would get so passionate, so excited about how amazing God is, and because he's right in the middle of this campaign, any mention of the campaign is not about like, whoa, look at us as Hope Elam. It's like, whoa, look at how amazing God is, and how good he's been to us and how amazing he is. And so I'm going to lose my mind when I hear about a campaign. 
okay? And we know you have it in it. You have it in you because we've heard it before. So we're going to try it one more time. And I just want you to pretend that it's November 19th, okay? I just want you to pretend maybe that it's not the 9 a.m. service. I want you to pretend you've had four cups of coffee this morning. And I don't want you to pretend it's a true fact. The Holy Spirit of the living God is in this place today, and so we're going to lose our minds, okay? So here's what, we're going to try it again. I'm going to re-announce the campaign, okay? And I just want you to pretend that you're going to lose your mind for an almighty God, all right? So today, we are kicking off the Shining the Light Together Capital Campaign, amen? Okay. Okay. We're about halfway there. We're about halfway there. Maybe, maybe, maybe we'll get there, all right? So this is way bigger than a building. This is way bigger than finances. This is way bigger than some human-made vision. This is about what God wants to do in and through us to build a lighthouse called Hope Elam. Now, when I say capital campaign, chances are there, we have a lot of different backgrounds in this church. There, there's a lot of diversity here, and because of that, there's probably hundreds of different views of what that is. Depending on your background or different part of different churches or organizations that have done fundraising or campaigns, you probably have certain ideas in your mind about what that is. And for some of you that are new, you're like, man, I picked the wrong Sunday to come. I finally get the courage to go to church. And what does the church always talk about? Money, right? I think you came on the perfect Sunday because God has a calling on you, your life. God has a vision for your life, and you're about to get swept up in something bigger than you. God is calling. The question is, are you going to answer the call? And for some of you, you've had a really bad experience with money and the church and campaigns and fundraisers. I got really good news for you. This isn't a fundraiser. This is so much bigger than that. And before you check out, I thought it might be helpful to do a little bit of myth-busting when it comes to what we're going to be talking about over these next four weeks. Because for some of us, this is new. And that's okay. So you okay if we do a little myth-busting here this morning? Ready for this? Myth number one. Oh, I know where you guys are going. It's just a big old fundraiser with a bunch of gimmicks and pressure and guilt. And so I think I'm pretty much going to check out. Far from it. Can we grow as our congregation in our financial giving? Yes, and we need to, and God's calling us to that, absolutely. But are we confident that God has and forever will supply all of our needs because he's called us to this, and he is going to equip us for this? Absolutely. We're not losing sleep over this. We're actually rather excited about it, and we trust him because you are an incredibly generous congregation. However, as leaders of this church, we're not going to use a giving campaign as some gimmick or tool to pressure you to give more. That's not what this is about. But here's what our call is, as your pastors, as your leaders, to not avoid certain topics just because culture has labeled them taboo in the church, when Jesus talks about it all the time. Our call is to develop a biblical understanding and application of stewardship, which is how we use and manage the things that God has given us well. Because Jesus, we're going to talk about money. We're going to talk about our time and our talent and our treasure over the next four weeks a lot. Why? Because Jesus talks about money and possessions and our treasure a lot. And so we're going to talk about it, and he cares about us. And when God's word speaks, we answer the call. Say, answer the call. When God calls, you answer the call. And so regardless, I want to just make this so clear. Regardless of meeting any financial goals, if we get to the end of this campaign together, this, this move of God, and we have a greater understanding and application and are living in generosity, as a church, then this campaign will have been a success. Our job is to be faithful, and we leave the results up to God. Amen? In fact, Paul writes this, just kind of sets the theme for the whole thing. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, let's read it nice and loud together like you believe it. Here we go. You must each decide in your heart how much to give, and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully. I want to make this so clear. 
If you ever feel an ounce of guilt or pressure in this church to give financially or of your time or your talent, keep it. Don't give it. Why? Because God is way more interested in your heart. And if the condition of your heart is angry or bitter or reluctant or wounded or like, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to withhold this and my heart's not. God's saying, let's talk about your heart. Because when we get a hold of your heart, when God grips your heart, it's so much bigger than that. Because our giving is an overflow of a transformed heart. Amen? God is interested in your heart. And so what you're going to see outlined in these beautiful folders that you heard about in the highlights earlier, I would encourage every single one of you, every single family to head back and grab one at the campaign info table back there. You're going to see some, uh, an, an explanation of, of why we're doing this campaign. Several large-scale uh, innovations and additions and growth that we want to do to our building here, in addition to our general fund giving. So you're going to be asked to give, for some of you, that are in that place financially, above and beyond your normal tithes and offerings, either a one-time upfront gift and or a two-year pledge above and beyond your giving. Now you hear that and some of you might think, oh, okay, this leads to myth number two. I knew it. I knew it. Go to the next slide. Churches are just in it for the money. I thought Hope Elam was different. No, 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 no. I get it now. It's all about the money. The truth is, God wants your heart more than he wants your money. And that's our desire as well. If we're going to be a church after God's own heart, then we got to realize everything is God's to begin with. Amen? It's all his. Everything that you would say is my or mine, it's his, and it's on loan to you to steward. It's to steward. That's kind of myth-busting number two here. It's all God's to begin with, and God doesn't need our money as much as we need to give it, because he wants to set us free from living a small and dissatisfied life. We have a God that is incredibly generous because he owns all things. He has all things. Our God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He is not lacking, and he's not sitting up in heaven today waiting for your offering. He wants to set you free because he knows how money and possessions can get their hooks in us. God cares about you. And he cares about me. And he's after our hearts this morning. That's what he is after. And so our prayer is that God would just dismantle any box that you have tried to put faith Christianity, the church in when it comes to money, and he would just fill you with such an incredible amount of joy over these next four weeks that you wouldn't know how to contain yourself. That you would give joyfully, sacrificially, and generously. Churches are not just in it for the money, but God has given us that as a tool, as an instrument, and a way of doing ministry. We have some giving goals that you're going to see outlined in those packets, and it's going to lead us to try to raise a couple million dollars in a month. And some of you are like, you and Pastor Brian have lost your minds, okay? And maybe we have, and some of you might say, well, that sounds impossible. It would be impossible if we were trying to do it on our own, if we were trying to do it on our own strength. But I heard that nothing is impossible with God. And I, and, and, and I heard... That we have a God, we have a God in Ephesians chapter 3, look at this. All glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work in us to accomplish infinitely more than we could ever ask or imagine. And I can imagine quite a bit. There is always more with God. Everybody say more. There is always more with God. So if you are apathetic to the whole idea of church this morning, there's more. If you are burnt out on religion, there's more. If you've had a bad experience with church and money and it's all about guilt and pressure, there is more. Are you going to come to God and say, well, this is where I'm at, you got to deal with it, or are you going to let God come to you on his own terms? As he is and not how you want him to be. How big is your God? Are you going to let him outside of the box this morning because he's not going to fit? We have a God that can do the impossible. Oh, there's more and you are needed, and that's myth number three. 
oh, I know, Pastor John, I really came on the wrong Sunday because we're just trying to make ends meet and I just got a new job or we're trying to provide for our family. I'm just trying to make it through each day. I know this campaign is only for wealthy people. That's not me. I'm going to check out, right? It's not for me, okay? Well, if it's only for wealthy people, then it's not for your pastors either, okay? So that's a pretty small group of people. So I'll just kind of check out over the next month and let those with financial means take control of this. I, I'm just trying to get by. And that would be true if this was a fundraiser. But it's not. This is an opportunity for every single person at Hope Elam to feel and to know that you are a part of something bigger than yourself and to find your part to play. Amen. To find your role in the body. Because every single one of us has been given time, talent, and treasure. And for far too long, unfortunately, sometimes this thinking creeps into the church, we elevate those that have been blessed with the treasure, and we kind of degrade those that have time and talent, which is all of us. But every single gift is different, but every gift matters to God. Amen? So if you're sitting there saying, I'm new, or I just started coming a month ago, I don't really know what's going on here, you are a part of this. You belong you belong, and you have a part to play. You are needed, and it's time to answer the call. Everybody say, answer the call. If God's on the other line, it's time to answer the call. Paul puts it this way in Ephesians chapter 4. He says this, We will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of the body of the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work and it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. I don't know what you see there, but I don't see like I'm going to check out and let some parts of the body handle this part. I don't know about you, but I read Ephesians 4 and I think every part matters. But in order for the church to be healthy and in order for us as a church to grow, you are needed. You belong. We were created to be a part of something bigger than ourselves. Think about it this way. It randomly popped into my head uh, this week, and I asked Jed if I could borrow some of his guitar strings. So maybe you can see these, maybe you can, or you can zoom in them on the, the camera. But uh, these are some strings uh, for, a, for a guitar, and they're not really doing anything right now. They're kind of useless, and maybe you've never thought about this with guitar strings before, but they come disconnected from their purpose. They, just by themselves, you can't do anything with guitar strings. I mean, you can do air guitar, you know, you can, you can pretend, right? They're in the wrong hands right now. When in the wrong hands, they're not really good for anything, but put in the right hands, they can do something pretty amazing. Guitar strings were meant to be connected to something bigger than themselves. Oh, hey, Jed. Jed just happens to be standing there with an electric guitar, right? I don't know, you maybe don't know a lot about guitars, but I double-checked my lingo with Jed this week. This is called the headstock, or you could say the head. This is the neck, and this is the, can you guess? The body, right? So you have the head and the body, okay? And here's what happens is a lot of us are like these guitar strings and we're going throughout life and we're like, I'm fulfilling my purpose. I'm doing pretty well. You're like, okay, that's cute and that's great, but they're still in the wrong hands. You got to get connected to something bigger than yourself. And so you could take some of these guitar strings and even though they are connected to the head, if they're not connected to the body, they're still not operational. They're still not living into their calling. They're still not living into their purpose. And a lot of us kind of look at this and you're hearing this sermon and you're like, uh-uh. Because here's the thing. If I get connected with the church, if I go all in for Jesus, I, I've never been a part of a capital campaign. What in the world is that? If I go all in with this, if I get connected to the head and if I get connected to the body, it's going to restrict me. It's going to restrict my freedom. And what these strings don't know yet is actually when they get connected to something bigger than themselves, it actually liberates them for the sense of purpose. 
And the same is true with you. If we get connected to the head, which is, we know from Ephesians 4, which is Jesus, and we get connected to the body, and you plug in and you commit to a mission and to a local church and something that's bigger than you, then all of a sudden we don't have to fake it anymore, and you can find your purpose, and all of a sudden you put those strings, whoop, we'll just leave them, you put those strings not in my hands, but in the hands of somebody that knows what they're doing and knows their purpose, then it can sound a little bit like this. Oh, yeah, there you go. Jed, I think we need a little something more. I think we need a little something more. Come on, Jed needs a little encouragement here. We need a little something more. You give him a little something more? Oh, it's not coming through for some reason. That's the, that's the pretend. Oh, there it is. Come on, let's go. Come on, here we go. Give it up for Jed Smith, everybody. There he is. You are not going to find your purpose in this life until you get connected with something bigger than yourself. That's right. Until you get connected with the head of the body who is Jesus and plug into a local church, it's time to answer the call. You know what that sounds like? That sounds like Jed shredding. You know what that sounds like to me? A healthy church. And here's kind of the thing I didn't mention that's essential to making that work in each and one of those strings to make them work, there's tension. Some of you want to run away every time there's tension in your life. Every time you feel stretched like those guitar strings and say, ooh, I don't know about this. I've never talked about money in the church before. I've never actually committed to a local church and I'm feeling a little bit of tension right now. Maybe, just maybe, that tension is God's intention for you to find your purpose, amen? So don't miss out on that. Maybe that's God, why God has created you today. It's time to answer the call. Great opportunity is born out of these moments. What does it look like to be a part of something bigger than yourself? Let's turn to Acts chapter 2. I want to give you a picture of that. In this passage that Amy read for us this morning, Acts chapter 2, just to kind of set the scene, is describing the early church. And Jesus has risen from the dead, and he's came back. And he sent his Holy Spirit, he's appeared to people, he set people on fire with his Holy Spirit. And so what do we have? We have followers of Jesus that are filled with the Spirit, and they are sent on a mission. Sent on a mission. Kind of sounds like us. So God has put out the call for this mission, and it's their job to answer that call. So what does their life together look like? It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, they were filled with awe. When's the last time you were filled with awe at anything? All the believers were together, had everything in common. They met together in the temple courts. They praised God, enjoyed the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Sounds like a group of people that are swept up into something bigger than themselves. And what was it about this group that made even people outside of the church want to be a part of that, it's that they were radical. Everybody say radical. That is God's call for us to be radical. First of all, radical devotion. They realize my number one calling is to surrender my entire life, and so I'm going to surrender to his word, and I'm, I'm called to grow. It's my devotion. Number two, radical connection. Did you see in the passage how often they met? It said every what? Every day they met together. Yes, they got together every, some of you are like, every day. People at church are weird. I don't know if I could do every day. I mean, I can, I can do an hour on Sunday, but that's, that's a little much, right? It would be unless you were desperate for God and you were desperate for each other. And sometimes I think we treat church as a cute little commodity instead of something that we're desperate for. We need each other. That word for they devoted themselves to the fellowship is koinonia in the Greek. Everybody say koinonia. This isn't like sipping coffee and giving each other a nod in the lobby. This type of fellowship is much deeper than that. Koinonia could be described like this. If you go to the next slide, this would be a, a little bit closer definition, a deeply spiritual tie. 
radical soul-level passion and bond. Something deeper going on. I had a gentleman come up to me a few weeks ago, and he said this. Pastor John, I just want you to know this. My family lives on the other side of the country. Some other members of my family have passed away, and I have felt very alone for the last decade. And then I stumbled upon this church called Hope Elam. And I have been here for six months. And with tears in his eyes, he looked at me and he said, this is my family. This is my family. Koinonia, it's something different. The best visual I can give you of koinonia is all of us, like like a team with our arms locked together. And we don't always agree, and we have our differences, but we're going to stay together no matter what because the mission is too important for us to give up now. Amen? And we're going to link arms, and we're going to stay together, and we're going to say, God, what are you calling us to do together? Koinonia. We're staying together no matter what. That's available to you. Radical devotion. Radical connection. And finally, radical generosity. People looked at the church in Acts 2, and they said, I don't believe in your God. But man, these Christians, nobody loves like them. Nobody serves like those Jesus people. Nobody loves like them. Nobody serves like them. Nobody listens like them. Nobody serves the poor like them. Nobody cares for the sick like them. And I cannot help but find out more. The Acts 2 church had a deeper calling, and so they started to live in a whole new way, and they started to develop a new rhythm, and they started to develop new habits in a community sense. But can I just get personal with you for a moment? Is that okay? Can we get real? Not that we haven't been real this whole time, but can I just be real with you? Earlier this summer... I was blessed with the opportunity to take a sabbatical. And I had eight weeks off to just rest and refuel and to be with family and to spend a lot of time with God. And one of the things that God made crystal clear during that time, he said, John, you have a calling as well. You have a purpose. And your number one calling is to follow me. Not to be a pastor, but to follow Jesus. And to love your bride, Tiffany, so well. To invest in your kids to lead courageously and faithfully this flock, this congregation, to have really, really deep friendships, to continue to tend for and care for your soul. So it's like God's given me this calling on a personal level. That's the call, but my lifestyle was not matching it. I was trying to be this man, but I was still living like this man. And maybe some of you have had these moments in your life as well. God is calling out to me. Maybe God's calling out to you. And God's been calling you, some of you, for a really long time, and you keep sending him to voicemail. But he hasn't stopped calling. And he didn't stop calling me. (laughs) And the truth is, there are some habits, there are some rhythms, there are some lifestyles that God is continually refining me and growing me in. I don't know about you. I don't want to exercise. Anybody with me? I don't want to do it. I don't feel like eating healthy. I don't feel like slowing down and taking the time to spend in prayer and God's word. I don't feel always like being around other people and investing and having a few deep relationships in my life. I don't always feel like going and seeing my counselor. But I know it's what I was created for. And there was a moment during sabbatical, I was just sitting on my deck and I didn't know it was going to be for this day, but I just want to share it with you. I felt like God said, John, your calling requires a discipline that's beyond your comfort. Your calling requires a discipline that's beyond your comfort. God has called, I'm here, and God has called me there. And so if he's calling me there, I can't stay here. It's time to answer the call. What do you do when your calling outgrows your comfort? Anybody there? If you're not there, you will be there at some point. Because God's not going to stop calling. What do you do when your calling outgrows your comfort zone? You develop new habits and new rhythms. Turn to your neighbor right now, look at him right now, and say, neighbor, I got a calling. Tell him that right now like you mean it. Say, I got a calling. Say, bigger than my comfort. 
Say, I got a calling bigger than my comfort. And God is calling and it's time to answer. And then I started thinking about We've been reading through the Bible this year, all these different stories of people that God ever used in a significant way. And there was a moment when their calling outgrew their comfort zone. And in order to follow God and be faithful and be obedient to him, they had to step out from where they were to go where God was calling them. God comes to Abraham and he says, Abraham, I want you to leave everything you've ever known and go to a place that you've never been before and see the stars in the sky. That's your calling. But in order to step into that calling, he had to answer the call. Everybody say, answer the call. And there's our friend Moses that God showed up in a burning bush and was talking to Moses and, he, and Moses said, no, 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 you got the wrong guy. But he forgot that God doesn't call the equipped, he equips the called. And he says to Moses, I know that you don't feel like you have what it takes, but I've got a calling on your life to set my people free in Egypt. And in order to step into his calling, he had to answer the call, right? Then there's our sister Esther, and she finds herself as a teenage girl before the king for such a time as this. And if she stays silent, an entire nation is going to be murdered. And so she speaks up for such a time as this because it was time to answer the call. I skip ahead to the New Testament, and Peter's there on the boat in the middle of the storm and the water. And Jesus says, step out of the boat. And Peter, if he was going to trust Jesus, he couldn't stay where he was. He had to answer the call. And I could keep on going, but I'm going to tell you this. There's a church at 25th and University that's been called to be a lighthouse. And there is a city that is crying out. There are mouths to feed. (laughs) There are mouths to feed, and there are kids to love and invest in. There are people that are lost that need to be found, and there are people that are in need of hope. And God has created us as a lighthouse, and we can stay on the sideline, or today we can answer the call. Say, answer the call answer the call, every single one of us. And that's what this next month is about. Our calling is bigger than our comfort. And it's going to require some new disciplines. Radical connection for us as Hope Elam. Radical devotion and radical generosity. Be at worship every weekend. One week of this campaign is going to build on the next. Come to an informational meeting. Have we said it enough this morning? And here's why. In Acts chapter 2, it says every day they met in the temple courts and in each other's homes. So if you got an issue with informational meetings, you got an issue with the Bible, okay? Sign up for an informational meeting. Why? Because it's biblical, all right? Get Get connected with each other. Get connected in the community. There are informational meetings today, tomorrow, the next day, all throughout the next two weeks. Sign up register today. Radical devotion. Pick up one of these folders in the lobby today. There's information in there to go deeper in your giving and your generosity. We're going to do some financial classes and workshops as well over the next couple weeks as well. Register for that. All the information is available there on the website. And last but not least, radical generosity. All of this leads up to Commitment Sunday, November 19th, or you can give anytime. And those same kids you saw up here this morning are going to lead us in our radical giving down the middle aisle in a processional offering, and we're going to bring our time and our talent and our treasure. Whether you have a penny in your bank account or not, every single one of us can be used by God. You are valued, you belong, and you are needed. Every single one of us. Amen? We were thinking of all these different, like, slick, mottos and themes for the campaign. We kind of like shining the light together and some people were like, okay, we need a little like gimmick or motto or something like that. You want to know what our motto is? Pray about it. No, you're not going to tell us what to give. You're not going to come to my house and tell me what I, nope, because we don't know what you give and it's not between us. It's between you and an almighty God. Pray about it. Pray, listen, and give. And let God blow your mind with the amount of joy that he wants to pour into your life. And I'm standing here today and I'm looking at all of you and I'm saying, my heart is so filled with gratitude. That's what this campaign is about, is giving back to God what he's first given to us. We have such a good God. He is so good to us. And so we're going to close. The band's going to do a song called Gratitude. And we've done it before, but I want to point you to the bridge. And there's a line in this song that just gets me every single time. 
and it says, it says, come on my soul. Don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song because you've got a lion inside of those lungs. AKA, you are needed. You belong here. You matter. You've got a part to play. You've got a string on the instrument of God's melody. You are needed. You are loved. We are called to let that lion inside of our lungs out. You matter, and you are more a part of this than you know. Wherever you're at, let's stand together and let's sing our gratitude to God. Thank you so much for joining us today here at Hope Elam. We hope this sermon really resonated with your soul. We are excited that you joined us and we look forward to you coming back. Have a great week.